Yeah. All right, I think I mistakenly, I just kind of overlooked six, but why not? Okay. Uh, how can you determine the type of correlation for a set of data pairs by examining the data in the table without drawing a scatter plot? Okay. Um, what do you mean by type in this section? It's all going to be linear or not linear. How can we tell if it's correlated or not? I was thinking about the relationship between X and Y, like X increases and Y increases. Okay. If we see an uh, increase in X, we can see an increase in Y. That's definitely uh, indicative of some kind of correlation. Or if X goes up and Y goes down, seems to be. Okay. So, yeah, some kind of a. But, you know, more generally, right? Because if they're correlated, it means that this relationship's not perfect. So, you may see some Y go up and down, and, but over the, the long term, you see that happening. Yeah, that's good. Nate? Uh, well, would it finding y equals ax help at all? Well, it would, but it would be. I mean, okay, so you don't have to put the data into um, a table. You could use a calculator to find the equation of the line of best fit. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, yeah. How would we know if it's very well correlated just by finding that? Because it'll find an equation for any set of data. How would we know if it's very good? line go through these points, right? And maybe that's about the best one I could possibly get. But this step is not very well correlated. If you give this data to a, a calculator, it will find it, the equation, that, the equation of that line there. But um, it's not going to be very well correlated. And how you know that is that you have this well, whatever. You have this value 0 or this, this value bar that is close to zero, so it's going to be like 0 0.0001 or something like that. It's going to be very tiny. Um, and that's going to indicate to us that it's not very strongly correlated. And R of zero. So it would give you the equation of the line. And if it gave you R, R would be close to zero, would not be very well correlated. Here, well, a really good R, the perfect R, would be one, or negative one, depending on the type of correlation. So, the R for this data, if we were to find the equation of the line that goes through that data, that line would look something like this. And the R would be, well, not terrible, not close to zero, but not excellent, not close to one, so 0.5, you know, given the choices that we have here. Somewhere between zero and one, 0.5. And maybe it's closer to 0.6 or 0.4, but that's not an option. We're just trying to get us a, a, a good option yet. Thank you. And this guy here, the line goes a negative slope, whatever that line looks like. And it's very tightly packed, right? It's very close to this line. So the R would be close to negative one because it is very tightly uh, correlated, correlated and it's negative correlation. So it would be close to negative one. Does that make sense? Are there any questions about those ones? R is called the correlation coefficient. And if it's close to one, then you have a positive correlation that's very good. If it's close to negative one, you have a negative correlation that's very good. And the closer to zero it gets, the worse the correlation is. Here we got uh, 10, which I guess I should have saved there. Let's get 10. Oh, 
we're supposed to uh, plot the data, find the our guess for the best fit, the line of best fit, and uh, write an equation that's you know, it's all based on our, our drawing. All right, so uh, we'll come over here and we'll grab um, a grid so that we can see pretty well. There we go. A little bigger. If they're all positive, so we'll just stay in the positive realm here. We'll make this. Uh, Two, three, four, five, we're fine. One, two, three, four, five. Need to go from uh, 10 to 62, so we just go by tens. That's all right. 20, 20, also 30, 30, 50, and 60. So 62 will just be barely above that. So 110, that's a point. Uh, 222, that's also a data point. Uh, 335. And 562, just above 60. All right, so these uh, does it look well correlated, strongly correlated? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty close. So we'll just grab uh, this guy here. I'll just draw a line. It looks like it goes through the data pretty well. It tries to split the difference. So now I need to write the equation of the line, which means we need two points that are on the line. The only thing is our line doesn't go through any of the points that we were given. It's pretty close, but we actually need to try and guess at some points that are actually on the line. Like um, this one, let me pick a different color. This one right here, where does it look like that one is? 561. Five, that seems like a good guess. And maybe this one right here. That one too. Where is that one? It's supposed to be 35, so maybe this is 36, 37. If one of you drew this exact line, one of you guessed 36 and the other 37, neither one of you is wrong. We're just kind of eyeballing it anyway, right? But if we all were to do this ourselves and draw this line and put two points on it, all of our equations would be pretty close. They would intercept the y axis at approximately the same place. And they would have about the same slope. Okay. We're almost there. We just have to write the equation. And then we'll have an equation that we can plug x into and then get y. So how are we going to find the equation with these two points? Find the slope? How do we do that? X squared y two. Y minus, yeah, there you go. 61 minus 36. And then you grab the calculator. 61 minus 36? 25. 25 over 3. All right, so that's our slope, 25 over 3. Right. Well, that gives me the slope, y equals 25 over 3, x plus b. You can plug in one of the x and y values. Plug in one of the x and y, about 236 if they're smaller. 36 equals uh, 25 over 3 times 2 plus b. b equals 36 minus 50 over 3. b equals uh, 108 over 3. No. Yeah. Minus 50 over 3. So the equation is y equals 25 over 3, x plus 58 over 3. And then it says what, Cody? Uh, when y, uh, that's right, y with x equals 20. When my x equals 20, how are we going to do that? Plug in 20 for x. Easy, easy. y equals 25 over 3 times 20 plus 58 over 3.
Is that 19.3? Just check and see what this looks like. Both ways are repeating. Are repeating? Yeah. 10. What do they have? Twenty-five over three. I can just throw that in the calculator. The way it looks: twenty-five divided by three times twenty minus fifty-eight over three. One hundred forty-seven point three repeated. Yeah, Because, yeah, we're just eyeballing the points that are on the line, just kind of giving us a guess, guesswork. Okay. So it should be close. Like, what's our slope? It's 25 over, 25 over 3? Yeah. It's not very close to 13. <laughs> yeah. That's not very close to 13. What's our y intercept? 58 over 3? That's not close to 4. Yeah, okay. So what's going on? What did I do wrong? It's 30. Sorry, there's 61. Oh, 336. This is 25 over 2. That is close to 13. Yeah. So this should be over 2. So we need to fix all that stuff that says 3. That's 2. That's 2. Oh, that's nicer because that comes out to be uh, 25. Right? No, we're plugging in 3. That's the problem. That's 2. That's 3. Um, so that's 36 minus, that's 375 over 2. That is B. So we get uh, 72 over 2 minus 75 over 2. Is that right? 72. Uh, so that's negative 3 over 2, B, negative 3 halves. It's closer to negative 4, right, like the book has. Our slope's a little different, so our y-intercept, you know, may intercept a little bit closer to 0. I've done something wrong here. So our equation is actually y equals uh, 25 halves x minus 3 halves. And then we plug 20 in there. And we can see what that is. Yeah, 25 over 2. Oh, 25 over 2, we want to plug 20 in there. So it's 25 times 10, really. The 2 cancels with the 20. Uh, minus 3 halves. 248.5. What did they get? Now, maybe if we took this to be 35 instead of 36, it would be closer. Or if we used a point down here and made a different guess, when we make these points that we guess on the line so close, it can really tend to change the slope by a lot. Uh, but it's close, and it's right, it's correct. It's, it's a good guess, good work. Okay. After we fixed all the mistakes. Okay, so next was 17, 18, 19. Let's see what that holds in store. Oh boy. So the mistake in what? Just drawing the line? Yeah. Okay, so what's wrong with that line? More through the middle, it's kind of toward, toward the bottom. Like it's slanted enough because the slope looks good. It's just not right. We just moved it up a little bit. We just grabbed it, moved it up just a tiny bit so it goes through the middle of the data. It would be better. 
Uh, that was 17. 18 is set of data has a correlation coefficient r. And basically, which one of these has the best correlation? You can see the answer is a, of course. Closest to negative one. Yeah, the closer that number is to one or negative one, the better the correlation. What, why is it negative? Negative has this negative connotation. Negative slope, that's all. Right? Negative slope, but good correlation. Very good correlation. 0.96 is ridiculous. Ridiculously good. Okay? Um, so that's 18. 19. Uh, graph calculator finds the equation <coughs> of the best thing in mind. Okay. Um, so, you can use your calculator. You can use Excel. You can use all sorts of things. But uh, I gave you that link to use. So, just a second. I don't know what I have up on my, I don't know I have pinned or not, so I'll just uh, pause that. And go here. So, for you guys, I sent this link. Right. And I won't make you sit through it, because... I'll figure out how to do that on my calculator. That's good, that's good. See, we have our x's here. We have our y's here. We can enter that into the calculator. All the x's here, all the y's here, hit calculate. And it'll give us an equation right here. It'll say some number plus some number times x. What will that be? It will be this. It will be 0.05x plus 1.14. So there's our equation. It wants us to graph it. So we draw our axes. We have a y-intercept of 1.14, so we just need to set a scale here. 1.14. And a slope of 0.05x, or not, not 0.05x, but 0.05. So if we come over 1, we go up 0.05, not very steep. Equation of the line of best fit should be about. Um, last one's 26. Last one is 26. Actually, I'm going to steal from another class. So this was pretty much the same as 10, only the data points weren't arbitrary. They came from some real life example. So we took the elevations, we put them on the x-axis. That's what it said to do up here. Make those the x's. All right. We set the scale 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, so on. And then we set the scale at uh, 3 for each of these tick marks to go from 190 to 208. And this little thing here it just means there's a break in the y-axis because obviously from here to here is 3. From here to here is 190. Right? So if I didn't put a break in there, it wouldn't be the scale at all. So when you look at this line, it's actually way, 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 way up on the, the y-axis, way vertical. You know? But so that we don't have to see a bunch of blank space, we put a little break in there. Okay, so then we plot all the points. Uh, 2,000 feet, the boiling point is 208.8. 
compile the points, you draw a line just like a number 10 is there, our guess for the line of best fit. You grab a couple of points that seem like they're on the line. You find the slope, there's our slope, just use it as a test one. Negative 0 0.022. And we put the slope and the x and the y into an equation. We solve for b. We plug b back in, there's a, our equation. Our guess for 14,000 feet is 185. So let's see what they have for the official answer. I think it's 75. So I guess our equation could have been a little better. They have their slope is 0 0.0018, not 22. So that's definitely going to make a little bit of a difference. But again, it's good. It's, it's the best you can do when you're just guessing at where these points are. The best you can do is to draw a nice, like perpendicular graph, plot the points as closely as you can possibly estimate them, draw a line and pick the points on the line as best you can. If you're a little bit off, we're off by 10 degrees. I mean, that's pretty significant, but we're just doing guesswork here. If we were to do an actual linear regression, we'd come out with the same answer. That is, there's only one line that is the best one. Any questions? That's not a question? Okay. I have a question. Yeah? We have to pay closely. Yeah. Are we going off of a graph on the quiz, like what they're graphing calculators? It's not going to be necessary. Okay. Are you going to teach us that today? Uh, I can teach you that another day. Or you can look it up. You could be very industrious and look it up, but I don't require you to. It helps actually. I think it's good. I mean, it makes you better. It makes you a better person to go through the effort of looking something up and figuring it out. But. Maybe not better person, maybe better learner. All right, so it's a multiple choice question. What we're asking is what is the equation? Of the line of best fit, All right? Can we eliminate any right off the bat? Negative. Negative what? Uh, slope. Slopes are negative. Yeah, the slope that goes through, or the line that goes through with this data, literally not a negative sloped line. So we can eliminate uh, this guy and this one. That's out. Okay, so it's between these guys on the side here. How about their y-intercepts? Are they so different? I mean, look at the scale of this. Are they so different that it's unbelievable that they might? Okay. So let's look at this one that has a y-intercept of about 50 and a slope of about 3. Just go with abouts. Uh, these are, like, both of these marks are worth 50. So we can just go a ratio of uh, 3 to 1. So 1, 2, 3 over 1. What do you think? Line that goes to these points, not a line of best fit. That's not a line, no. but, but it gets the idea. Across. It's more of an artistic expression of a line. Okay, so no, that's not going to work. It must be this one, just by default, right? Where you can go about 13 is like almost a quarter of the way to 50. The slope is 0 0.8905. Let's see, so that's it's almost a slope of one, just not quite, so if you go up one and, uh, or over one and up, not quite one. So maybe if we draw a line through there, we'll get something close. And there. Yeah, you know, my, my points are probably aren't so good, like that slope probably wasn't totally accurate, but definitely, that's the, the best candidate of all of them by far. the equation of a line given two points. Uh, Adonis here. I have a random name generator that comes up with some funny names. Right, right there. What do we get? Doris. Doris. So I can come up with some funny ones. So uh, 
it is Adonis this time. Adonis is trying to find the equation of the line between two points. What is Adonis's first mistake? Yes, he gave up before he even tried anything at all. Okay, that'd be a pretty common mistake that I see. It's becoming less common, but it is common. So just try something, apply some knowledge that you have. Don't just give up before you even start. All right, here's another common one. You even start to do some right work and then just give up. I see IDK. Drives me insane. I wish I could I could take credit off for saying IDK, but that wouldn't be right. That would not be. Uh, that doesn't mean that you know it. That's what you said. IDK. But, um, well, did they do something right? Did Adonis do something correct? Yeah. What do you do? Well, Surprised how often I see this work that's correct, and then just like, wow, well, you do know, you're doing it. You just stop doing it. Okay. If you were to just you know, uh, clean this up a little bit, simplify, you got a nice slope there. It's a good start. Right. You're started. What did they do correctly? Found the slope. Uh, where did Jonas go wrong? Stop. Giving up again. Stopping. You started and then you stopped. Stopping was the problem. And you know, sometimes you do the slope and that's all you can remember to do and that's fine. As long as you can think of something to do. Um, so here we are, a, another attempt. This is Adonis does it correctly. Right? Saves the day. It comes through. Uh, what does Adonis do in the blue step? What's that blue step? Into the slope. What's that? Slope point. It's a called point slope, but I mean. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uses the point slope form. Instead of that, can we do it differently? We can do the y equals m x plus b form. We just plug in the chance of the line. Nail it. Oh, okay. Maybe I'll do it. It's a bad day. Uh, uses point slope form. We could use the slope intercept form instead. Right? So you go about this way. Y equals mx plus b. We know the slope. We know an x and a y. Let's use um, 9 equals negative 3 halves times. What is that? So negative 2 plus b and solve for b. 9 equals. Cancel out that it gives us a positive 3 now plus b. b equals 6. We plug it into the slope intercept form and we got it. So here we go. Graphing the uh, x, y defined function is a common mistake that I see. So here's this filled in green point. Why do you think Ronan has placed uh, the closed green point where he has, where he did? This is the y-intercept. If you look at the green, it's got a plus 6 there, right? That's the y-intercept. So I put this point at 6. Why is that a problem? Because the x, the x, what you mean by the x is this, yeah? because the x isn't zero, if the x were zero, then that would work out great, because we'd be on the y-axis. But we're not on the y-axis, we're at x equals four, right here, okay? We're at x equals four. Not that we can't use the y-intercept, it's just that the y-intercept means where it intercepts the y-axis. If that line was allowed to continue. If it were allowed to continue, then let's let it do that. Let's let it continue and put it at what, the six, We'll just move this line over. Okay. Now it's correct. Now it is y equals negative 3 fourths x plus 6, right? But it doesn't quite work with our piecewise function, right? What's the problem? It can't go into this zone because it can't go into this zone. 
Right. We're in the zone of less than four. X is less than four. So what should we do about it? How can we fix it and make the green part correct? Cut it off. Mm -hmm. Just cut it off. Okay. So I'll just kind of pretend like I'm erasing it. I just don't have that graph or x is less than four. Just grab our pen, grab the green, put a close circle right there. Because x is four for the green function. But I made the same mistake with the blue one, right? The y-intercept is negative 5. So there we go. So now what's the problem with, with that guy? I, I've used the y-intercept. It's got to go up to the dotted line. It's got to go up to the dotted line. So we'll just bend it up. Okay. It should come up to like about there. Should look like this. Yeah, but like it's like on a five, you know. So like if they tried and had points, but they're not in the right places, so mm -hmm. like you could. Let's say generally, like if it looks kind of like this. Um, but the lines are totally off. Like if there's like a dotted line at four, to indicate they understand what this means. That's like a two. If the if, the, if they've got this line and their their graphs are actually correct, but it's just like missing something, or they maybe they drew their line too far past this line, I would probably go with a three. Okay, and a four would be like not really even tiny mistakes you're gonna make with your everything. So, so you've got everything point. right, but I can't tell what the slope of this line is very easily. Yeah, that might be a four out of five. And if you're not sure, you can just leave it. I'm going to grade it later anyway. So I do want you thinking about that kind of stuff. Question. So the moral of that story is you can use the y-intercepts. Just make sure you're not plotting them on the what one student called the border between these two functions. Don't plot it there, that's not the y-axis. Y-intercept y means on the y-axis. So go to the y-axis, use the y-intercepts. Just make sure that when you're done, you have graphed everything you should and no more. Right? If, I, if I use the y-intercept to graph this green one, make sure I clean that up. If I use the y-intercept to draw this blue one, make sure I continue it all the way to x is 4. I put an open circle right there. That open circle is pretty important. If they miss an open circle, I'd say that's a four out of five. Now we're solving this absolute value equation. Okay, so starting with this red step and then continuing down to here, what is it that you see here that is not correct? value. I see that a lot. Be careful of that. It's the reason why we set up those two equations is because it doesn't make sense to just bring things outside of the absolute value. As soon as you change the inside of the absolute value and leave the absolute value around it, 2x minus 17, you know, there, you can get different values for x than 2x with a plus 17 over here. That, that, that minus 17 is part of the inside of the absolute value. Um, yeah. Well, that's the thing. I, I've seen this, and the absolute value means the positive, right? So the absolute value of negative x is x. See what I'm saying? So he just kind of took it to be absolute value of negative x is x. So he didn't really divide by negative one. He just took like, oh, absolute value means positive, so I have positive x, um, which is not correct. Um, yeah, so let's 
it's all kinds of leaving the absolute values on there just causes all sorts of problems. All sorts of problems. Um, also, let's assume he didn't leave the absolute value there. He did everything all right. Really, what he he could kind of fix it by doing this and then dividing by negative one and getting negative fourteen. Or is it? Oh, it's on. It's a, it's Linda. It's a she. So she has done about half of the work. What else is she supposed to do? Make Check her answer. Check her answer. That's something. The opposite of the right side. You gotta take the right side and do the opposite of that. So let's see what that looks like. Right, now we're good. Now Linda has uh, fixed that mistake, left the absolute values off, setting up two equations here. Okay. Now we've got to set it equal to the opposite of the other side. So you distribute that negative. Um, so yeah, we kind of talked about that already. And that blue step right there. What's a, what do you think is a common mistake that happens? Common mistake people make. Don't do the x. Yeah, they do it either just to the number or they do it just to the x. They don't fully distribute that negative. Okay, so this would be a mistake: negative three x minus three, or three x plus three. Okay, we don't quite understand what's going on here. This step inside the absolute value could be identical to this step right here. If this step is identical to this step, the absolute value of this step is going to be equal to that step. Of course, as long as this is positive, right? It's got to be positive. And again, as long as this is positive, then this step over here could be equal to the opposite of this, as long as it's positive. This is 5, then this will be negative 5, right? It'll be equal to the negative of 5. So 7 is equal to negative 7. Okay. That would work out just fine. So that's right, take the negative on the other side. But now, what's one more thing? Linda's almost done, not quite done. Has to do what? Check her answer. Check her answer. How should you do that? I'll just sit back into the formula and see if she gets positive on the other side. So plug it back into here to see if she gets positive. Let's first plug it into just everything and you'll see why you won't have to plug it into the right side. Okay. Two times negative 14 minus 17, that's in the absolute value. Make sure you put it in the original, not in this, not in this, in the original. Uh, equal to 3x minus 3. Okay, so this is going to come out to be negative 45. This is going to come out to be, oh, that should have been negative 14 going into x. This is going to come out to be negative 45. Seems good. Looks the same, but absolute values can't be negative. Absolute values are always positive. Positive. Impossible. It's impossible. So that's not a solution. Okay. Over here we try it, and so we realize that we only are concerned with what the right side is. We don't really need to check what's in here. I know what's going to happen in here. I'm just going to get the opposite of whatever this is. That's what the equation says that I set up. Right? So this comes out to be, well, let's plug it in there, into here. 3 times 4, minus 3, that's 12, minus 3, that's 9. Okay, so this is 9. The opposite of 9 is negative 9. So what's inside here will be negative 9. Right? And that's fine. The absolute value of negative 9 is 9. That's where what all we need to know is, is this side positive. And it is. So that is a solution. So we got one solution. We got one extraneous solution. One solution that doesn't work. Make sure you check in your solution. All right. Tally that pass back. Here's what I have. Uh, a riveting film about this thing called a ditto machine. You ever heard of a ditto machine? No. Is it like coffee? It's better yeah. cool. <laughs> Not that cool. But uh, so I want you to understand how it works. And then I'll tell you about a machine I used in my student teaching, which is similar. And we'll, we'll base a little problem off this. So just take a look at this, how this thing works. He's putting the original piece of paper he's making copies. Uh, putting the original piece of paper on a drum. All right, so he's going to tighten that down and then uh, you'll just kind of see how it works.
See how the, the print is kind of purple? Yeah. That's the way Ditto machines worked back in the day before Xerox machines. Okay. So, I got this thing called a, a Ditto machine. Now, I didn't, I've never used a Ditto machine myself. I, I saw them used. My mom helped in my elementary classrooms and she would use them. But the machine that I used when I was student teaching was an old machine. It wasn't quite as good. It worked a little bit different. Okay. So instead of putting the actual piece of paper on the drum, the drum was like inside the machine, and you would scan it in. It had like a glass, like a zero machine. It would scan it in. It would, it would make. Don't ask me for the the exact particulars of this. But uh, here's a, a piece of paper inside the machine that it would have to make every time you wanted to make. Not for every copy you wanted to make, but every, like if I wanted to make a copy of this piece of paper here, right, and make a bunch of copies of, of that on this machine, I would scan it in, it would make one page that was kind of like a copy, but it, it had all this, this black stuff. You know what carbon paper is? Carbon. You've seen carbon paper? So it was like carbon paper. And this carbon paper would then kind of act as like the paper did in the, in the Ditto Machine video. And it, it would actually, I think, like I said, I don't know the exact particulars, but it seemed like it would get put around the drum and somehow it was the thing that went around and then it would turn out the, the copies that way. Okay, the, the Ditto, the slew we call them. Right. And the advantage of this machine is that you saw how quickly it was just spitting those things out. Like it had to have this little metal piece of uh, and it would just, it was kicking them out and it had to, you know, it was ting, 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 ting. And with this, with this is what it was like at the, at the school where I uh, student taught, where you would make copies on this thing and it would just make just ridiculously fast copies. But the, the downside is it had to make this messy carbon paper thing. And it had to make it every time you wanted to make copies. And when you were done, you know what happened to this piece of paper? Throw it away. You throw it away, right? It's like a lost cost. You have to throw away that however much that piece of paper costs, every time. Not so with a Xerox machine, right? You scan it in, it just prints it out. It doesn't have to make anything. You don't have to throw anything away. You don't have to waste stuff when you're done. Okay. So they also had a regular copy machine. Okay. Just a regular old copy machine. A Xerox machine, if you like calling it a Xerox machine. Okay. Um, and the thing was, though, and I actually, I might, that might be an email right now that I was waiting on. Hold on a second. I called the school where I used to student teach, asked this information. The thing that I wanted to know is I, I know there was a, a sign um, on the, I think it was on, the, on this machine, the Ditto type of machine. Okay. Call it a Ditto machine, it's not quite correct. Let's say it was a Ditto machine. And there was a sign it read. Um, do not use for fewer than, I think it was like 20 copies. Okay, see what I'm saying? If you've got 10 copies to make, go over here to the regular copy machine. Right. But if you had more than 20, they wanted you to come over here and use this Ditto machine. Okay. Now, why do you suppose that is? Why would they want you to not use this? It'd just be a waste of time. What would? Just using money to get to like 15 uh -huh. pieces of paper that you ruined. Would this come. piece of paper right here. Yeah. And it's not just a regular piece of paper. It's got this, this carbon on it. It's, it's almost like if you took your pencil sideways like this, you know, and like just rubbed all over an entire piece of paper. It's kind of like that. That's how messy it is to touch. Uh, that's what kind of carbon paper is like. And that piece of paper has to be created every single time. So it's not just a regular piece of paper. It's more expensive than a regular piece of paper. It has all this carbon all over it, OK? Um, so there's this upfront cost. Every time you press start, uh, it makes a piece of paper. And it prints out the things, and then it discards it. You have to throw it away. And if you make like five copies and five more copies and five more copies and five more copies, well, you just made 
four or five of those pieces of paper that you had to throw away. Whereas if you made five over here, uh, five over here, five over here, five different print jobs, right, then you haven't made these pieces of paper. But then why would you switch or why would you ever not use this machine? Why would you come over here and use this for say like 100 copies? It's too fast. Faster, sure, it's a little faster. More reliable. Mm, it's getting pretty old, it's not, not terribly reliable. It's pretty simple. Now, school districts don't care a whole lot about how much time it takes you to make copies. What they do really care about, and for good reason, is cheaper. how cheap is it? Uh, we don't want to spend money where we don't need to, right? So we'll uh, have you come over here when you're making 21 or more copies, or I guess 20 or more, no more, no fewer than 20 on this machine. Right? So it seems like for lots of copies, this is cheaper overall, and for not as many copies, this is, is uh, like for fewer copies, this is less expensive. But you know the, the same is true for the, the inverse. This is more expensive for lots of copies, and this is uh, more expensive for just a few copies. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. Okay. Um, there's the cost of this piece of paper, right? Let's say fifty cents. So let's say that it is that the cost of this is. Uh, uh, for carbon copy, for, for carbon paper. Okay. So you're gonna make that carbon paper. Now, what else is it costing you to make copies? Ink. Right, the stuff that goes into every piece of paper. And every piece of paper is gonna cost the same, right? Over the, in the long run. So this has a cost not just for this piece of paper, but a cost per copy per piece of paper that it pumps out, right? The paper costs money, the ink costs money, and so on. So it's got a cost per paper, cost per copy. Let's say this one's per copy is, let's call it A. A is the per copy cost. Now, let's come over here to the copy machine. Does it have a carbon paper to make? No, it doesn't have a, like, every time you use it, it costs 50 cents or something. What does it cost? Electricity. Yeah, and all electricity, all that kind of stuff. Everything is could be divided among all the copies, right? Each copy takes the same amount of electricity, the same amount of ink, same amount of this, same amount of that. So this also has a, co a cost per copy. We'll call that B. A per copy cost. Does it have anything else? Once I know how much it costs per copy, does, is there anything else to consider? The initial cost of all the yeah. Buying it and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll just say we take that cost and we'll split it up uh, among, like, per copy, you know? There's that. I mean, that's smart to do, to figure out, well, how much does it cost us? How does it cost us to, to lease it? Uh, how much does it cost per copy? But we'll, we'll make it simple. We'll just say, take into account the toner and the, the piece of paper itself. Anything else besides per copy that this machine costs? Like each print job? That doesn't seem like it. So the, the fact that this becomes cheaper at some point is, was the motivation for somebody to make this sign. It was just a handmade sign. Just hanging out. Um, so we want to find out, is it right? Was, was 20 copies right? Or if I, get to, if I ever do get to see the Delphi Insulator, we'll find out maybe how many copies they said, what the sign actually said. Um, what I want you to do is for X copies, that's the number of copies. Y representing the total cost of a print job. Like if I printed a uh, hundred copies, Y would be the cost would be the, the, the cost of a hundred copies. Um, write two different equations. One for this scenario, for the digital machine scenario. And for X copies, how much the total cost would be? I realize there are no numbers involved. I mean, there are, the numbers are A and C, okay? But I have
time I told you what A and C are. So what would you do with A if you knew what it was? And what would you do with C if you knew what it was to find the total cost? Okay? I want this to be an individual thing. And then write the equation over here. You know, Y equals some expression over here with like B and X that would tell you the total cost if you knew how much it costs per copy on the Xerox machine. Okay? So we're trying to find the equation for each machine. Yeah, two separate equations. One for the Ditto, one for the Xerox machine. So let's... Uh, do that for a minute or so. <laughs> All right. So let me grab it in there. Uh, so the, the total cost for the ditto machine. Well, first we have to make the carbon paper, right? Let's just get that out of the way. That's going to cost however much it costs. Then we're going to add on however much the copies cost, right? How much? Do, how do I figure that out if I make the copies and so much? Ax. Over here, there is no carbon paper, so it's very similar to this scenario without the carbon paper. It's y equals px. Now, if you ever try to write an equation, you're not sure what to do. Just put some values in there. See what you do with those values, and then replace those specific values with the with the letters. Like, if I had told you that this costs three cents per copy. It's not the word copy. <laughs> copy. Three cents per copy. And uh, say it costs, I don't know, we'll be crazy and say it costs 95 cents to make one of these pieces of carbon paper. I have no idea how much this is. probably like $2. Today they don't use that, uh, except for in Hellgate High School. I called it this morning. I'm still using it years later. Um, so let's say it costs three cents a copy, ninety-five cents to make that carbon paper. Now, what would you expect B to be in comparison to A? The same. The same. Yeah, a different number. How would the the number that I give you for B compare to the number I just said for A? It'd be the same cost per copy. It would. Well, think about it. This costs three cents per copy. B will cost more per copy than A will. Why? Because B uses bigger inkwell and it's not using as much ink because it's perfect. Well, if B were three cents a copy. No, because every copy gets the same amount of ink and all that. Like, it gets the same attention, right? So, uh, at a certain point, oh, that becomes more expensive. Yeah. yeah, so listen up. If they were the same per copy, why would there even be this machine in that room? Because it's cheaper. Well, if, it were, if they were both three cents per copy, then somebody at some point in history would have removed it. As soon as the Xerox machine showed up and they realized that it cost them the same per copy for this machine as it does for this one, they would get rid of this one. They would say, why are, we, why are we using something that costs the same per copy and you have to make this carbon paper, right? And you have to spend 95 cents on the carbon paper. So what would you expect to see B in comparison to A? More expensive, More expensive right? More expensive. That's why we're willing to pay the 95 cents, say it's 95 cents, uh, because the cost per copy is less. Right? At a point it balances out. And at a point, if I make cheaper. enough copies, then, it, then this becomes less expensive. But I'm just going to make a few. I don't want to pay that 95 cents. That's a lot of copies I could make at, say, 5 cents a copy. Five cents per copy. <laughs> so if this can do it at three cents a copy, of course I would want to use this all the time compared to five cents a copy. It's just that I have to make this piece of paper to start with. That costs money. I don't want to spend that money. Right? Uh, if it's going to cost less to use this guy. So if I just make three, four, five copies, I'm going to use the ones more per copy because I don't want to put in that initial 95 cents for that copy. Okay. But at some point, as Connor's been saying, they are like, 
the, the ditto machine is going to become less expensive than the Xerox machine. Okay? Apparently, I don't know if they, they tried very hard, if they did any math to figure out 20 copies. Uh, I don't know if they had somebody from the math department to do that, or an out of a student, or if they just were like, eh, 20, let's just say 20. Uh, but we're going to figure it out for sure, exactly. Okay. So let, let's grab another page here, because it's getting kind of messy. So we got the ditto machine. Let's say its equation is y equals, we'll put some specific values in there, uh, 3 cents a copy times the number of copies, plus that 95 cents. Could grab it. That's for another day. Uh, here we got the Xerox machine. And it is, say, five cents a copy. Right. So, before we start to think about this graphically, let's just think about it numerically. I'll just bring it down on the screen. <laughs> what do we want to figure out? We want to figure out when. Will the Ditto machine become cheaper than the Xerox machine? Let's do this. Let's set up a little table. We'll just start off basics. Okay. Now I'm going to make a case for function notation again because I want to compare this total cost to this total cost. Well, this total cost we call y, and this total cost we call y. Now that's confusing. How can I fix that? I can call this f of x. Call this. Now when I say f of x, I know what I'm talking about. I know what g of x goes to this guy. We can call this d of x, because it's a ditto machine. We call this big x of little x. That would be confusing. We can call it a z of x, and it sounds like a z of x. We can call it whatever we want. But now it's, uh, the table's a little more uh, simple to understand. Let's try you know, Five copies. What would you expect at five copies? Would you expect this to be more expensive or this to be more expensive? The ditto. The ditto machine's going to be more expensive. What about at six copies? Ditto. Ten copies? Ditto. Fifteen? Ditto. Keep in mind, I don't know the exact values, <laughs> so, so that sign may not be accurate for the situation. Or that sign may not have had a lot of thought put into it. Maybe not any math put into it. What about 20 copies? Getting close, if not, that already happened, I don't know, 25. So, Zero. let's do this real quick. Let's plug in five into this function and this function, see how they compare. Six, see how they compare. 10, 15, 20. See if we can get an idea of where we break even and where the ditto machine drops down below. Yeah, you just go for it. You, if, if you have five, let me know. Oh. Yep. One point dollar ten cents. Point two five. Twenty five cents. Good. That's a big difference, right? That's why we use this one for smaller amounts of copies. Six copies. One point three. And this one. Thirty cents. Thirty cents. Right. This is good. Going up by five cents every time. Ten. Okay, let me show you something. Um, let me show you how to use your calculator. Just make this so fast. You have two functions. Uh, I can't show you both of them at the same time because my calculator is in the way. You turn it on, and the y equals. Right? That's what we have. We, we have two y equals. Two functions of y equals. y equals 0.03x plus 0.95. Other one is just 0.05x. If I want a table, there's a button that's for table right there. Second and above graph is table. Mr. Stewart, yep. X at? Right there. Right below mode, right next to alpha. Above the color button, either a blue or green button. All right, now, I'm going to guess some of you are going to be able to do what I'm about to do, and some of you will not be able to do it. 
How's that? Oh boy. You hit second, and then the Dang. graph button. So, I can hit 5, 6, 10, 20, and it's doing it all for me. Right? 20, 25, 30, Titan 47. 7. Oh, it's so close. This is still just a little bit more expensive. 48. 48. Done. Now it'll just overwrite me. For, like, it won't drop down past 47. It'll just overwrite 47. Uh, 239 and 240. So at 48, not exactly 48. Not exactly 48. But 48 is, the, so we would want our sign to read for no, for, for, for no fewer than 48 copies, if all that was true. If the piece of paper cost 95 cents, 3 cents per copy for the ditto, 5 cents per copy for the Xerox. Now, are any of you not able to just enter a number in for X? No, I can scroll all the way down as long yeah, as I want. Yeah, I can do that. Okay, scrolling, that's not good. We want to enter it. Okay, I'm going to show you how to enter. If you, don't, if you can't enter, please follow along with me. So if you have to scroll down, forget that. Okay? Go to second, press the second button, and see table set right here. It's table setup. T-B-L-S-E-T, -E table setup. You are going to have auto highlighted in the independent. Independent is X, right? You know about independent and dependent variables. The independent is X. You want to ask it, right? You want to enter the value for X. And then the auto, of course, is automatically going to calculate for Y. Ooh, it's Now you should be able to enter anything you want into the X column. One hundred, yay, holy crap, one hundred, one thousand. Now we go to the table, you should be able to enter things in the X axis. X axis. Oh my god. Alright, so, I mean, all the way through 25, it didn't work out, it took going all the way to 47, 48. Find exactly where we break even. All right, so that's the table approach. So now we know what to put on the sign. If all this stuff is true about the Ditto machine and the Xerox machine, we know to put no fewer than 48 copies. Make at least 48 if you're going to use this Ditto machine. We can do that anytime. If we want to know when two two functions will be equal to each other, when the cost over here will be the same as the cost over here, we can use a table. Let's say, though, I was going to give you another example, but we're running out of time. So let's use this, this one and ask a silly question. So we all just, uh, keep so ask a silly question. Well, it's not exactly 47, and it's not exactly 48, right? The silly question is, what? What number of copies exactly would I need to make? Now, why is that a silly question? How do you make half a copy? Yeah, how do you make a fraction of a copy? That's not something that would be harder to do. You'd have to cut it with a knife because it comes out of the machine or something. But wait, it's still printing the ink. But the principle is the same. How would I now algebraically actually get that exact amount? Well. What would you say? So I want to plug. I want to plug in the, the exact right x into this equation and this equation. Right? It's going to be the same x, isn't it? The exact same x. The exact same number of copies. And what will I get here and here? The exact same. Okay. So this you want to make that thing. 
will be equal to what this function gives out. And then we'll find the exact. Then you solve for x, you find exactly 47 point something. Have a good day.